Living the Faith Podcast. Brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media. RestoringTheFaith.com This is the Living the Faith show coming at you every week from the Restoring the Faith studio, where from the heart of America, Joe and Mike are here talking about something that was stolen from us. Something that was taken away from us that used to be a part of what we believed and now no longer is. Hey, this is Mike here, and we are going to give a quick recap. A couple weeks ago, we came at you with a show about the precepts of the church. The precepts of the church from the most recent catechism of the Catholic Church are thus. There are five. The first one is that you have to go to Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. And you have to rest from servile labor, which actually that was the interesting point there on that particular precept, which we don't hear a lot about these days. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you shall confess your sins at least once a year. All right, low, low bar, but we got it. Third, you shall receive the sacrament of the Eucharist at least during the Easter season. Okay, so if you're going to claim to be Catholic, you have to receive communion every now and then. Fourth, you shall observe the days of fasting and abstinence established by the church, of which there are very few now. And five, you shall help to provide for the needs of the church. But there's something missing here, Joe. Is it missing or is it otherwise it's absent? It's kind of absent. Uh, it's not, you know, it's just kind of mysteriously dropped. So there's, it's a little bit, it's just interesting you know, we, we talked about in the last show, I believe that the number of precepts has fluctuated in the past. And so we're just down one, strangely. And um, it is an interesting one nowadays for it to be mysteriously just disappeared. Yeah. Um, they, for the most part, for the the greatest part of the that sixth precept, was stuff that we still definitely believe in um, as Catholics. We right. We, we, we have to. Um, and then there's a little bit of um, discipline that is thrown in there as well that makes sense and we can go through that. Um, but it's an interesting time for it to be missing, obviously, since the, the sacrament of matrimony is under extreme attack, especially with um, all this crap in the news yeah well that's the right word for it yeah um what, yeah, what just, else can you call it right exactly so uh, you know be marriage being between one man and one woman period uh period end of story right. it seems odd that it should uh the, the this these problems are rising um within you know very close proximity of it being absent yeah um, so as a quick administrative note to our listeners, we originally published this exact show, which contained an error, and out of uh, charity for our, our listeners and to God, we pulled the show and we were redoing it, so we will be without that particular error. But it's interesting because I think both of us, uh, when, we were, when we became aware of the omission of this sixth precept, which we're going to list, um, we immediately went back to older source documents. For example... Uh, the Catechism Explained, published by Benzinger Brothers, over 100 years ago in 1899. Benzinger Brothers published a lot of great stuff, and that's where I get a lot of historical stuff that I think is just bedrock and un unchanging and certainly worth reading. But there were, there were six precepts of the church, and as you've alluded to, Joseph, they, they have to do with marriage. Uh, so why don't, you, uh, why don't you lay it out for us? So there's pretty four main points out of this uh, precept. So the first part of it is not to marry people who are not Catholic um, or are who are related to us as uh, within and including the fourth degree of kindred, um, nor privately without witnesses. And uh, lastly, not to solemnize marriage, uh, that is to say, 
commit the mm-hmm. <laughs> active right. matrimony yeah. um, during uh, forbidden times. Forbidden times. Okay. So four parts to it. Uh, we should probably unpack each one of those parts. Sure. I think the first one is really interesting. How often do you hear a priest say not to marry someone who is not Catholic, period? There are fewer and further between. Right. Nowadays. I mean, these days, um, it's perfectly okay and acceptable to marry someone who's non-Catholic so long as they make these uh, kind of wishy-washy promises, which sound something like this. I promise that I will allow you, good Catholic, to raise the children in the faith, and I won't be an obstacle to that. Um, I promise that I will be open to life, sort of, as it suits us and our economic conditions and our social commitments. Just, just as a note for that, that is actually something that is explicitly still required for anybody if you happen to be in this situation and still planning on moving forward with it. Yeah. The church does still require you to uh, make a commitment. There there has to be a commitment by both parties to raise the, the children as Catholics. Right. And to permit you to fulfill your Catholic duties, et cetera, and so on and so forth. But obviously this creates... A ton of problems. I, I um, met a uh, by this by this you mean uh, uh, mixed marriages between Catholic and non-Catholic. Yes. Okay. 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 And it, it's in in a certain way. I'm I'm glad that this is coming up because in a certain way this just shows God's divine providence in having us re-record this show in the first place. Because only just last week, uh, a girl that I work with, who's very very sweet, very kind uh, woman, and. Uh, she and I were, were talking, we were um, doing an office deployment and uh, I made some sort of comment. She's like, oh, so oh, oh, it was because it was Friday and I wasn't eating meat. And uh, she was kind of, she was like, oh, you need protein, you need your energy. And I was like, it's Friday. Oh, and by the way, it's an Ember Day. You probably saw Mike's uh, Ember Day posts. Uh, so, you know, we've delved into that before, I believe actually in I think we did. Yeah, we, we did. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I was like, well, she's like, well, at least get a big salad. And I'm like, no, actually I actually need a small salad. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be like a gluten free or a, oh, I have a peanut allergy thing. You're on like, the West I, Coast I, diet. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> I was like, I'm not trying to be picky. I'm just I can't eat meat right now. And I can't eat a big meal right now because I have got to save that for later. Or I won't go to sleep. Um, and she's just like, oh, so you're Catholic. And I was like, yes. And she's like, well, I used to be Catholic. Wow, oh, a growing denomination. Yes. In fact, probably one of the largest yes. denominations in Fastest the country. Fastest growing denominations, yes. <laughs> Things have accelerated lately, in fact, in that in that yeah, regards. For Not sure. the non-Catholic, the the former Catholic uh, denomination business is great mm-hmm. for the former yeah, Catholics. All right. Exactly. Keep, so, so so she she, she thinks she you're on the married. California hippy dippy diet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she re- re- realizes that I was Catholic and then she gets very interested and we start having a conversation. She's like, oh, I used to be Catholic, you know, and she's like, I actually still go to Catholic mass. I just don't go and receive communion. And I'm like, uh, OK, I'm confused now. And she's like, well, I married my husband uh, used to be Catholic. And I'm like, oh, OK. All mm-hmm. right. Now. This is getting more complex. Oh, and now he he converted to become a Methodist, and now he's a Methodist minister oh. who used to be Catholic. And then I met my husband, and he asked me if I would marry him. And I was like, well, no, of course I can't marry you because I'm Catholic. Well, are you willing to you know revert to the Catholic faith? And he said no. And she's like, oh, okay then. And then they got married. And I was just so saddened and by they this. Got married in, did they get married inside the church or not? No, 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 okay, no. Okay. They're, they're married, I, I, yeah, married Protestants. And but why does she go to mass still? I don't. Well, I don't know. And you know that's between her and God, certainly. Um, but it was very sad because I went and visited all these beautiful churches, and I took pictures of them. And she was just like, "Oh wow, that's so beautiful." And you could tell that she really missed it. Yeah. Now being, you know, a, a Methodist, and yeah, I'm going av- to venture to say that they are probably one of the only young couples in in the Methodist Church. Yeah, because both used to be Catholic. Yeah, it, well, if you think that we're having a demographic crisis in the Catholic Church, uh, you look at mainline Protestantism, and they are basically all Susans, <laughs> Susans and above. Susans like, and above. It's like median age at, at a mainline Protestant church nowadays yeah. is like sixty seven. Well, actually, isn't it like the biggest like non-denominational Methodist? Yeah, 
No, no, no. Non-denominational. Like people are saying, well, I'm just non-denominational. Oh, yeah, yeah. Non-denominational. Yes, <laughs> right. yes, that's, yes. But former Catholics the young... in the United States is a pretty, exactly. pretty significant yeah. portion. Or your Joe Olstein guy. Anyways, the point was is that I was, I, I was just, I was so really sad. It, God sad wants and... you to be rich. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes, you said right. Joel Alstein. God, yeah. If God doesn't make you rich, it clearly he doesn't love you. He doesn't love you. Let it go, Mike. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. You said Alstein. We just I had know, a hurricane. I, I thought about how he locked all the poor people out right, during right. the floods. It was great. Um, but the the point was, is I was like, you know, it's because then we were kind of talking about, you know, the fact that I, you know, didn't eat meat on Friday and all this sort of stuff. And then I just yeah. said to her, I was like, you, after she had just finished telling me who I'm not like, we're not like best friends or anything like that. It's just a coworker of mine. And I haven't been working with her directly for that long, but she, you know, just came out and said all these things, which to me, of course, sound absolutely horrible. Yeah. Um, and she, I, I just turned to her. I was like, you know, isn't it kind of funny? You remember when you were a Catholic, right? And people used to make fun of you for saying, oh, well, you're Catholic. You have to obey all these rules and such. And she's like, yeah, I remember that. And I was like, yeah. So, you know, isn't it interesting that mm. there are all these rules, but all, they only make sense in hindsight. And this is one of those rules. This is right? definitely one of those rules. Especially for today's world when we live in such a romantic, oh, romanticized gosh view about life and whatnot and just marriage it's just a this is just a garden of roses well people get married today because they are in love that's why you marry you marry whoever you love and when you stop loving them then then you don't have to be married anymore and that's and, pretty much it yeah when, when when your marriage is based on love which is really infatuation would you bat your eyelashes a little bit more when you say when love I, say, I think <laughs> i think that's the love that you're referring oh yeah, to. yeah let me put the camera on me yeah. when you say love <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and you're really emotion, talking about love, you're talking right? about yeah no it's it's a fleeting emotion it's a fleeting emotion it's really just infatuation it's really just a carnal love right. not true love no I mean the Greeks had right. like three or four different words for love right I mean they and had they different mean- words for love and they had different meanings you had you know had filial love you had eros love uh, we're really talking about eros love okay that's the kind of love that people get married for today and guess what that stuff tends to fade over time it does. Yeah. It yeah. really does. Love is a decision. We all know that. Okay, so not married persons who are not Catholic. The second part of this is, or who are related to us, Joe, within a forbidden degree of kindred. Okay, how often are we facing that particular issue these days? Um, it doesn't happen very often. Not often. No, this, this is definitely yeah. something that you would have seen in areas where people lived in pretty much the same place right at all times yeah. and whatnot and yeah, yeah it, it's just so like I, pre-industrial okay. well, just, just, so we're, just so we're clear to <laughs> just so we're clear that yes this 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 could have this does happen oh uh, a it, lot yeah <laughs> yeah in but, various places of the country and yes. various places in the world but to actually <laughs> be concerned about somebody if you're related to somebody more than likely, um, you're. You I really don't know thought you person. were going to stereotype. I was so prepared for you to say something no, like no, no, somewhere no. south no. of the heart of America. Uh-huh. No. Maybe south east. and east. <laughs> yeah. There are places all over the place. There are definitely places all over the That's place. That's right. That's right. But the, the, the main point is, is that it, you pretty much have to, don't have to worry about it if you're related to somebody. That, I, I mean, I guess you could say, laterally speaking, if somebody was in a four, yeah, it's it's a little bit difficult to to say, but yeah, basically, it's within a certain d- number of fourth. degrees of separation, yes. and that number even has changed over time. As it has the actually, the church, uh, the church actually started with seven degrees. Okay, so and she, now now yeah. it's four. So wow. Anyways, seven the was main untenable. Point is, but we actually, when we did our show about pa- the family, the. F- family book, right? Mm. And we talked about how everybody is just kind of reinventing themselves in America every single generation. And you've got these kids who are going off to school to find themselves and discover what they want their their legacy and their patrimony to be. And people move around a lot. They're much more mobile today. So you're really just not going to encounter in the 21st century this problem where you know, you're know, you attempting to marry someone who's within four degrees of separation from you. But that certainly was a concern back in 
pre-industrial Europe where people moved around much less and you might have someone who has worked the same land for 600 years, you right. know, for multiple Various generations, 11 generations and right, exactly. So that was certainly a concern back then. So, all right, we'll give we'll give uh, Holy Mother Church a pass for dropping this particular right. This particular. I wouldn't really call it giving a pass, <laughs> but you know, but it's more understandable that we have dropped the um, forbidden degrees of kindred from the precepts of the church. Which, as a reminder, the precepts of the church, also called the commandments of the church, are if you don't follow them, it it encounters um, pain of mortal sin, right? Yeah, I, I I don't know. I think I, I guess it's just a little bit more confusing about why it's missing. Again, the thing is, is that anybody can do it, right? I mean, it's yeah. readily available to cross that line. You would hope that people would be more, you know, disgusted by that. But you know, yeah, that's the, well. Let's go that's, into that's let's go point. into that right now because just a very brief history of the of where when and where this particular precept dropped out and some some interesting um, corollaries to that. This precept was included in the church for a very long time, um, and it was included even as recently as the 1917 Code of Canon Law. So this was the sixth precepts of the church. Incidentally, that same year, that Code of Canon Law, which was published um, under the auspices of, I believe, Pope St. Pius X and Pius XI, both contributed to that Code of Canon Law um because it was a multi-year process to get that to get it published Obviously, yes um but when that code of canon law came out 1917 again same year that our lady appeared to us at fatima portugal and she very prophetically told us that one of the very important things that we should be focused on is defense of the family that the family will come under attack and that that will be a huge war that the devil will wage against the family. Now, not because because we didn't give a, a parental warning and because, you know, we there might be children listening to this podcast if you're in the car or whatever. Suffice it to say that the devil's coordinated attack on family is um, is flawless. I mean, he's 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 attacking the family from almost every single angle. From from you know uh, who you believe yourself to be, from who you can marry and how often you can uh-huh. marry, and and the the types of things that are permissible yeah. b- both within and outside of marriage, and for the destruction of human life, and right. you know th- from from the materialism. Um, well, it's it's just it's interesting, right? It's like we've reached such an, an age of enlightenment and intelligence. Yes, that um, you know, as in previous the the dark middle ages and all these people who needed all these guardrails. Now all of a sudden it's like, you know, it's like that, that snake game where you have like the, the wheel and you're supposed to have like guide this ball on this wooden plank that's shaped like a snake. Right. All of a sudden we could just, Hey, lift up all the, uh, off all the guardrails and then let's just let them balance it. Let them go across the whole, you know, the the Adam Smith, uh, capitalist invisible hand will reach down and guide everyone. Right. Right. It'll it'll maintain, order miraculously right and that's the whole point of all these precepts in the first place right yeah to put up these guardrails so that we'd be like hey don't do that you know um, right. let's try to keep everybody on the same general yeah. you know going in the same direction so the very same year that our lady warned about this happening is the same year it was the last year in which we officially promulgated in the catechism of the catholic church that this was the precept of the church fast forward to 1983 it's no longer there and it is conspicuously absent. Also, fast forward to the 20th century, the 21st century, and marriages are down, vocations are down, the faith has collapsed, you know, the attacks on the marriage are, are, are impending. And even as we record this show tonight, the marriage is under attack even within the church. Mm-hmm. So um, it's, it's interesting. So, yeah, you're right. Um, to bring up uh, why is this missing, certainly worth talking about certainly worth meditating upon and your point i think also is very valid that just because it's not a precept of the church doesn't mean that any of this is invalidated you shouldn't be marrying within four degrees of separation you certainly shouldn't be marrying outside of the catholic church and the third point here of four the third of four is nor privately without witnesses joe now i am aware of this happening a couple times um this is kind of sad, but I'm aware of a family who, uh, whose daughter went out and eloped. She eloped. Don't do the antelope. Uh, don't do the antelope. 
she did it within the church too. I mean, they had to priest shop. They had they mm. fi- they ended up finding a priest who would marry them. Many of her friends and colleagues and coworkers and fellow students within the parish were in on it. But guess who wasn't in on it? The parents. How can that happen? So did you tell me that like they were like let known about the wedding like hours before or something? I I think so. Yeah, I think they were ultimately invited to the wedding, but at the very last minute, like day of. Very very sad. But but you can't do that, right? You, you you're not supposed to do that. Why? Because you as the father and you have you have three daughters currently. God only knows how many daughters you will have in the end. You have to give them away. And no one can marry them without your authority. They have to seek your blessing. Mm-hmm. That's a very old school thing. We don't do that anymore. Right. But um, again, to your point of guardrails, uh, wasn't the world more ordered when we mm-hmm. did do that, when we did seek the Father's blessing? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's funny, right? And of course, we have all these, you know, modern day fairy tales and movies about the cruel father who didn't approve and blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, is, why do we approve? Why do why why do most women seek the approval of their father? Yeah. In that, why is why is meeting the parents such a big deal? Good question. Right. Because the thing is, is that for most people, definitely for Catholics or for most Catholics, anyways, that our parents, even if they weren't necessarily the best parents, even. Um, and I'm not, that's not speaking pre- pre- no. pejoratively to no, not all, at all. but I'm just saying, even if they weren't the best parents, we still hold them up as a uh, moral compass yeah. of, you know, hey, well, I mean, if they don't approve of them, then it can't be good, right? Like it's a low, at least, at least a low bar, right? Right. Of something that you believe is to be good. And if you don't believe this is going to be a good marriage, then you shouldn't be marrying this person. But if your parents will approve of that person, then at least that's it's reassuring to you that you're doing the right thing. This is an important and a big deal, right? And there are a lot of people out there who will be like, well, you know, I, I, I don't need my parents' approval for this, blah, blah, blah. I'm my own person and I can do this. Yes. But the point is, is that these people have been around for longer than you have. They've made more mistakes than you and have. And that's exactly it. They've seen the world. They've been around the block. And to your point, even if they are not, you know, the best parents in the world, you can't help but learn a thing or two as you go through life. And furthermore... Nobody knows you better than your parents. I'm sorry. Your friends don't know you as well as your parents do. Mm-hmm. Your siblings don't know you as well as your parents do. Your your parents changed your diapers, okay? Right. They've seen you evolve and grow up from infanthood to the adulthood, okay? Mm-hmm. They've been there every step of the way. They know you, and if they say that this isn't the right person for you, maybe they're on to something. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is, too, is I don't know a lot of Catholic parents, and I'm sure there are exceptions out there, but a lot of Catholic parents who were like, yeah, I eloped. It was the best thing I ever did. Like, <laughs> I've never heard. Right. Any, I, I've met right. plenty of people who have eloped, yeah. and I have not heard a single person say, They're yeah, not, like, I was bragging the best thing. about it. Yeah, no. No, Usually you have to like get, you have to like fish for that detail right. out of them. Like, oh, tell me how you guys met. How was your wedding? Who came to yeah, it? So oh, where was, was it? Uh, Vegas. Uh, we got married in Las Vegas. Oh, really? Which church? Which which church? Church in of the- Elvis. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. Wow. Yeah, people aren't really proud of that. No. It, the, the So... It, it's it's kind of a, a, a um, it's multifaceted in in that regard, and and before anybody else brings up the excuse, also, and this would be that would be an example of that is well you know mom and dad you you did this, well and so I should be able to do it this way myself you know whatever that is with regards to the detail of the marriage the person it is that right. these people are learning from their mistakes yeah and while they may not even admit to a mistake on their part yeah they can still see how it could have been done better how it could have been improved or sure. how what they did was wrong but they don't want to say this is why this is important to yeah, have well, and and this is just witness right. So this, the church isn't f- forbidding you to get married without your parents' approval. Let's just be clear about that. This is with a witness. Good point. Right. And if you can't find one witness, then, um, well, maybe you're doing the yeah. wrong thing. Right. All right. So fourth. Well, uh, well just, just to, to, to close I'll out close on that. Close it out. The, with regards to the witnesses, this is important because 
you if you uh, say, well, we got married, two of us, we got married in front of a priest and whatnot, who is officiating at the wedding. This is important for two reasons. This is a societal event. Yes. Marriage is not. It's not a private thing. Private thing. This is for public society because it is yeah. for the rearing of cho- for the bearing and rearing of children. And so we need people who know both parties so that they can speak to impediments inside a marriage. Yeah. If you don't have pe- somebody to hold a, a, a Catholic in good standing to look at you and be like, who knows hey, you? Who knows you? Yeah. You wonder why we have a problem with annulments nowadays? Right. Why, why yeah. it seems like anybody can get Catholic divorce. Oh, I mean, annulments, right? uh, the, the percentage of annulments that are approved in this country is something like 98%. I mean, it's a very, very high number. And they, ha- they have these so-called processes, too, in each diocese where, you know, they kind of send them to an approval board. And it's like, it's like three clerics who sit on the board. And yet, for some reason, all of them unanimously approve all of these annulments for almost any reason in this country. I know somebody... I, speaking of Sin City, I know somebody who has got who has achieved four annulments. Four, four, mm. four. That's awesome. That must be some sort of a record. But she married into the Catholic Church on her fifth marriage. That that can still get taken care of. <laughs> At the Catholic Church, <laughs> we, we can fix anything. We can. We can. Well, it, it made it easier. Although she had this big binder to get rid of the first four, um, I, I think it made it easier because the first four were not Catholic marriages. That does so make it easier. It does. It does certainly help. But. To your point, though, I mean, we're talking about Catholics who get married in the Catholic Church who then can get their marriage annulled merely because they don't like each other anymore. I mean, it's really a sad thing. Okay, moving on. So there are four parts of this sixth precept of the Church, this missing precept. And the fourth part is not uh, to solemnize marriage at forbidden times, Joe, at forbidden times. So there are times of the liturgical year in which it is appropriate to solemnize marriage, and when it is inappropriate. And I mm-hmm. bet if you're hearing this for the first time, you instinctively can guess that maybe I shouldn't be getting married during Lent mm-hmm. because marriage is a happy thing. It's a party and I shouldn't be having parties during Lent. I'm I'm guessing that most people, that just sounds true. It will click with them. What say you? Yeah, no, times, times of penance, times of particular, I, I believe that you can't get married on... Um, Holy Days of Obligation. Okay. Or Sundays, right? Can't get married on Sunday. Right? right? So, not that, you know, obviously every Sunday is another Easter, right? And so you can't get married on Easter, which is also on a Sunday. <laughs> uh, so, it's <laughs> that's, not one of those, that's not one of those floating feasts? No, no, that's it doesn't a fixed, float. Yeah, Easter okay. Sunday is strangely always on a Sunday. It's always on a Sunday. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> but, um, yeah, the, the, there are very specific times where when, when you get married, Right, this is a contract between two parties. Obviously, as with all Catholic things, that uh, it is it involves Christ, Our Lady, the Saints, the Church, and everything like this involved in the sacrament. But with marriage, particularly, this is about these two parties, and it's this contract that takes place between these two parties. They yeah. become the focus of the the event. And this is not something that should be, we should be focusing on a marriage on a time or, or a contract between two parties, celebrating a contract between two parties mm-hmm. during times that are reserved for penance. For example, during Lent, right? Mm-hmm. When you're you're supposed to be meditating on the passion of Christ yeah. or on Easter when you're supposed to be uh, celebrating rejoicing, the res- rejoicing yes. in the resurrection of Christ. Yeah. Or, or I'll, I'll even add to that uh, during Advent when you are uh, awaiting the birth of of the Savior during Ember Days, which we've talked about uh, a couple times. It happens four times a year. It's a Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, four times a year, um, roughly coinciding with each season. Um, During Rogation Days, of which there are three in the calendar, two uh, precede uh, uh, Ascension Thursday, and there's one other Rogation Day. I can't remember when it is, but the general context of those days is these are days of prayer, fasting, and abstinence. Right. How can you have a wedding when you're having fasting and abstinence? 
What are you going to serve at the banquet, right? Hey, everybody. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a really lame yeah. wedding. I, in fact, I don't want to be invited to that. But I have to, I have to say, I, I just put the camera on you, but I'm putting it back on me. <laughs> this is really sad, Joe, okay? And for those that are listening in Podcast Universe, you should be catching us live on YouTube. Well, not live, but we're recording for YouTube, and we have cameras and things, and we're doing stuff with our hands and making gestures to make emphatic points. But... One of the points I did want to make was I got married during Advent. Didn't know better. Hey, 12 years ago, got married in the Catholic Church. In fact, the prelate who married us is now a bishop. And I have to wonder out loud if this particular man is advising his diocese about the rules of marriage or if it's just perfectly okay. We didn't know any better. Yeah. And so now, um, the day before Advent starts is when we celebrate our anniversary. And it's really sad. But I think this is an interesting point, too, because some of our audience will hear this precept. And they, will th- they, they may be tempted to think to themselves that, oh, my goodness, maybe my marriage isn't valid. Or maybe I've been married in sin and I haven't confessed this right. or whatever it is. And, and suddenly scruples start to, to creep in. And we certainly don't want that. Right. Right. So look, if you married your sister, then I would have scruples. I would definitely go take care of that. Okay. But regardless, if you believe that you have broken any of these four parts of this precept, just go talk to your priest, right? Yeah. Go talk to a competent official. Yeah. You did not have any culpability in regards to this. You're not, like you say, living in sin or something like that. This is all very important to, um, to consider and not have scruples about it is a sad thing, right? There, there are so many truths about the Catholic faith that have, uh, and, and nuances and beautiful traditions and yeah. all these various things that we wish that we had the fullness of. And that's what we're trying to uh, reinvigorate and reignite here at restoring the faith media. But we don't, we, we, we live at the time that we live in. This is this is a time of, of troubles that we're trying to uh, help uh, reignite. Like I say, sure. uh, the the Catholic faith. So it is, while it is sad that you may have missed out on these opportunities to observe these things or to not do these things or to participate in these various traditions, these are all things that we can help share with other people. Absolutely, and, adopt them immediately yeah, and pass them on. Exactly. And what I hope that our audience sorts to realize is that we could have spent this entire podcast show just sort of obsessing with the conspiracy theories about why this precept was dropped from the from the code of canon law, right? But that's not what's important. And what we've given you here today are some practical ways to implement this precept and to take it into your family and to use it and to pass it on, and that. As you said, Joe, that's the heart of restoring the faith. That's what we're trying to do here. That's how we restore the faith. We don't admire the problem. We admire the solution. Living the Faith Podcast, brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media. RestoringTheFaith.com